Good morning, everybody. Uh, lots of uh, uh, familiar faces. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you, Deborah, for uh, the invitation. Uh, the next session is going to talk about uh, federal funding for research in forensic science. So uh, very, very, very briefly, um, of course, the 2009 uh, National Research Council report that we know as the NAS report um, that increased, increased awareness for, um, about the fact that forensic sciences uh, really uh, needed more research, both uh, applied and fundamental. Um, and the Center for Statistics and Forensic Evidence, uh, CSAFE, was created as part of that effort to help address that need uh, in research. So CSAFE is a NIST uh, center of excellence. Uh, we've been funded through a cooperative agreement with NIST and have been in existence since 2015. And currently, uh, it is a consortium of five uh, research one universities. Uh, Iowa State University is the lead institution. Uh, partners are uh, University of California and Irvine, uh, Carnegie Mellon University, University of Virginia, and we recently added uh, Duke University, the law school, actually. Um, the the mission in CSAFE uh, is to conduct uh, what we call mission-driven, uh, both fundamental and applied research to build a statistical framework for pattern evidence and digital evidence. Why do I talk about mission-driven? Uh, because the idea, of course, is to carry out research that will eventually find its way into practice. And so um, one of the things we do uh, with a lot of effort is engage as many in the forensic uh, practitioners and research community and also in the legal profession to share knowledge in both directions. So if we want to do mission-driven research, we need to know what the mission is. Uh, and of course, we provide training at all levels uh, for a wide range of stakeholders. The website for CSAFE is right there. Visit us. Uh, we are always happy to hear from people. So federal funding, um, to say that it's minimal when compared to other disciplines is, I think, an understatement. Um, I think at this moment we're doing forensic research on the cheap, and it would be nice to, um, to, have, more res to have more resources to carry out the research that needs to be done. So today we have four speakers that are going to address this issue, I hope. Uh, maybe not. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Farrell from uh, the National Science Foundation, uh, Dr. Jonathan McGrath from the Department of Justice, uh, Mr. Robert Ramatowski from NIST, and Mr. Jean Peters from the FBI will talk about these issues. We're starting with uh, Dr. Jonathan McGrath. He serves as a policy analyst with the Department of Justice, National Institute of Justice, uh, Office of Investigative Forensic Sciences in Washington, D.C. He joined NIJ in 2015, and uh, I met him when he was supporting the National Commission on Forensic Sciences. Um, he manages the NIJ uh, Center of uh, uh, Excellence, the Technology Center of Excellence, that's at, uh, located in RTI, and the uh, NIJ Forensic Lab needs technology, technology working group. Uh, he was, before joining NIJ, uh, a forensic scientist with the U.S. Custom and Border Protections Labs and Scientific Devices Directorate in Houston, and then in uh, Washington, D.C. He has a Ph.D. from um, Georgia Tech in Chemistry and an M.S. in Forensic Science from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, I should say speakers have about 10 minutes so that we have some time for questions. 15. Okay. <laughs> I'll give you, I'll give you the I'm going to rush it. Let's see if I can pull it up real quick. I'll give you the eight-minute warning. Sounds good. All right, stick with me, folks, because we've got a lot to get through. So I'll just go ahead and uh, get, hit the ground running. So I'm Jonathan McGrath from uh, NIJ. I think uh, most people are familiar with NIJ, but I'll go through a little bit of the introductory slides just to make sure everyone's on the same, fa same page. Uh, first of all, uh, DOJ disclaimer, the, uh, the views and, and thoughts and expressions are, are my own, uh, only not the views of the Department of Justice. So NIJ, the National Institute of Justice, is the research evaluation and de development evaluation arm of the U.S. Department of Justice. And our goal is to strengthen science and advance justice through all of our programs. 
And within NIJ, we have the Office of Investigative and Forensic Sciences. And I really want to stress the fact that we do both investigative and forensic sciences. You hear a lot in the media right now about the, the, uh, the onset of rapid DNA being used uh, for police investigations and being used in booking stations uh, early in NIJ's uh, federal uh, funding career, uh, uh, we supported much of the, the research that went into the rapid DNA technologies. But then for the forensic science side as well, we've supported uh, virtual microscopy for firearms examinations, invested heavily in the 3D optical topography that I'm sure some of you have heard about and is uh, about to be implemented in, in labs across the United States in short time. So our mission within OIFS, our, our Office of Investigative and Forensic Sciences, is to improve the quality and practice of forensic science through innovative solutions that support research and development, testing evaluation, technology, information exchange for criminal justice community. So I want to start just a little bit about just our broad forensic science portfolio. As you can see here, we focus on accurate and reliable forensic science uh, research, focus on rigorous peer review process and, and reviewing the applications that are submitted. We're looking for innovations and we're also looking for partnerships and collaborations. We're looking for supporting new investigators and really working uh, broadly, not only with uh, our federal partners who you're going to hear from, but also with the state and local community. And I do have a couple handouts uh, from some of the slides that I'll show uh, sitting at the front that talk more about our, our research opportunities. So I want to make sure that this AAAS audience has an idea of the opportunities that are out there for you as well, not just for forensic science practitioners. So just to give a little bit of history, since 2009, um, when the report came out from the NAS, uh, prior to 2009, NIJ had been funding research uh, on, a, um, on a regular basis. Uh, however, uh, every year, uh, NIJ funded uh, biology, forensic DNA programs, and every other year they funded uh, forensic discipline-specific programs such as, as trace or instrumental analysis. But after 2009, NIJ started the fundamental research to improve understanding of the accuracy, reliability, and measurement validity of forensic science disciplines and kind of changed up the scope of how the R&D solicitations were put forth to the public. And uh, so in starting in 2011-2013, uh, NIJ had two separate solicitations, one on basic or fundamental research and then one on applied research. And basic was about a third of the portfolio and applied was about two thirds of the portfolio. But from FY 2014 to present, we've had an annual solicitation pretty much bundling everything together uh, within one solicitation to be both basic and applied. And this is a yearly solicitation This presumably will be coming out again for, for FY 20. And you can see the eligibility requirements here. Now going a little bit of the history here, you can see over the last decade um, how the R&D funds have fluctuated and as Alicia mentioned too, forensic science research is, is uh, somewhat under-resourced. Uh, we don't have a, a dedicated federal uh, R&D budget for forensic sciences. So we do what we can with the, the funds that are available and you can see how uh, the funding has changed over time. On average about 20, uh, $22.5 million per year and this year we made about 44 awards. Uh, so you can get a sense of, of where R&D is at when funding about $250 million uh, since the NAS report. And this gives a sense about the success rate and the number of applications that have come in. We typically see about 200 or so applications come in and, and fund uh, about 20 to 25 percent, uh, sometimes as high as 40 percent of those projects that come in. What do we fund? Uh, the biggest part of the portfolio is forensic biology and DNA, but we also have impression and pattern evidence falling short behind. That includes the firearms, the latent prints, uh, blood pattern uh, analysis, et cetera. Of course, so we've got trace, anthropology, and medical legal death investigation, and you can see the rest of the list there as well. Who does the program fund? Well, primarily it's academic institutions. Many of the academic universities have a research uh, uh, funding machine uh, built into the, the system at universities. So it's a little bit harder for public labs to get involved in the, in the research funding. Uh, so we did develop a, a program specifically for public labs that I'll talk a little bit about. And so that's the research and evaluation for the testing and interpretation of physical evidence in publicly funded forensic laboratories. This changed a little bit over the years. Uh, we really want to uh, in, instill that research culture within crime labs at the state and local levels. And so you can see here, we've funded about 23 awards since 2014. We've also tried to stress the fact that uh, we want other researchers to partner with very closely with public crime labs. So currently, uh, the applicants must be a partner with a publicly funded crime lab. It doesn't necessarily have to be a public lab by itself. We've also uh, constructed a matchmaking page to connect researchers with practitioners. So crime labs can uh, post research questions that they're interested in to try to connect with other researchers around the community. We also have our graduate uh, research fellowship program. Um, first off in STEM, but now we're combining it with the social sciences, and I've got a handout here as well. Uh, basically, there's an annual stipend for doctoral candidates, and you can read the details online. Um, John Butler was one of the uh, fellows in one of the earlier iterations of this program back in, I believe, 1993 when he was doing his capillary electrophoresis work with the FBI. Um, so we're, we're, very, we're very, uh, very positive about this program, and as you can see from the orange bars in the bar graph, 
as we get more and more awards uh, uh, applications coming in, we try to fund as many awards as we can, but we're just, we're, this program continuously grows. And you can see from the number of peer-reviewed publications and conference presentations, we've got a lot of outcomes from this program. I would be remiss not to mention the 2015 NAS report. It doesn't have as many citations as the 2009 NAS report. I checked on Google Scholar, but I, I task everybody in this room and in the webcast to, to start citing this report. <laughs> So the support was it basically looked at, you know, what has NIJ done in the R&D world since the NAS report came out in 2009. And basically, the, uh, Alan Leshner from AAAS chaired this group, and it was right starting or just finishing its uh, um, activities when I joined NIJ in 2015. Uh, but they found that NIJ has contributed to the building of a research infrastructure necessary to develop and sustain research that advances forensic science methods. And here are a number of the outcomes from that report. And I really want to stress the fact that the NAS report um, mentioned that the expanding the NIJ has expanded the size of its research and development portfolio across the forensic science disciplines, including the other, um, the other uh, citations you see here as well. So what is the program impact from the NIJ Forensic Science Program? You can see here we've had over 370 uh, grant projects since 2011, over 650 peer-reviewed publications, presentations, et cetera. We're really stressing the research, the workforce, and building up the community of practice for forensic science. We've got a number of databases that we've also invested in. As you can see here, many of these we've uh, worked with our federal partners to help host and, uh, and build these databases. And we have another, uh, lots of other best practices and guidance reports that we've developed over the years that aren't specifically just for forensic science research, but also focused on the practice and understanding the impact. We've worked with our social sciences, uh, scientists within NIJ to, to look more closely at, at what, what is the investment and what is the impact within the criminal justice system. We've got nat national best practices for sexual assault kits, for cold case units, and our fingerprint source book report has been one of the most downloaded um, uh, reports in NIJ history and also has a Spanish version. John mentioned earlier our Forensic Technology Center of Excellence that's uh, run out of N uh, RTI. The pro purpose of this program really is to take NIJ's investments in R&D and help to translate it into the field. So we have a number of success stories that have been identified from our portfolio that you can download. Everything on the website is freely, freely accessible. We've got podcasts, we've got webinars. If you're ever interested in a specific discipline within the forensic sciences, I highly suggest you do a search of the information that's stored here uh, in terms of landscape reports um, and other products. And so I want to just end on the fact that we've worked very closely with our federal partners. Um, we've done uh, a series of meetings with this, the federal partners to look at how we're uh, investing in forensic science research. We published a landscape study back in 2016. In the last couple of years, we've met annually, and we hope to put out another publication on the, uh, the research investments. But we want to reduce redundancies. We want to encourage collaborations amongst the federal partners. And as you'll hear from NSF, uh, they'll talk a little bit about the industry university uh, partnerships. You'll hear from NIST about the firearms database that NIJ helped to fund as well. I think we put in about $15 million or so into to, um, looking at interagency agreements with NIST and others, looking at human factors, as you see the latent print report here too. We're also working with CDC to host a medical legal death investigation working group. And as John mentioned, we've got the new Forensic Laboratory Needs Technology Working Group. And we're meeting this week uh, for the third time in person to discuss the needs and the implementation strategies to move those technologies into forensic practice. And the last thing I'll mention is the, the forthcoming report to Congress on the needs assessment of the forensic laboratories and medical examiner corner offices. So keep an eye out for that report as well. And if you didn't catch everything I just mentioned in my 12 and a half minutes or so, uh, you can subscribe to NIJ Alerts online. So I want to thank AAAS. I want to thank all of you for attending this meeting. And I, I look forward to the uh, question and answer session. So thank you. Keeping to the time. Good start. Thanks. Any questions? We have a minute. If we, we have time for a few questions. Uh, no questions? I have one question while uh, Rebecca gets going. So, what, what do you, what's your, um, so NIJ has funded a lot of uh, the creation of a lot of databases. Uh, one of the, I think one of the issues in forensic research is that data are not easily available to the wider scientific community. What's your view on um, you know, implementing some NIH type requirement that anything that gets funded through NIJ needs to see the light of day? <laughs> Can you hear me now? All right. 
Thanks, Alicia. No, I, I think uh, that's a really good question. And I think, um, number one, it's, it's, it can be very difficult to, to form a database that's appropriate for both casework purposes and for research purposes. And I think that's something that we tried to do uh, working closely with NIST on the firearms database, uh, collecting both 2D and 3D uh, images. I believe all of that work is, is available online um, and easily accessible for research purposes. And I think that that is a goal, is to make the, the databases as open and as transparent as possible. But we do have to also consider the, uh, the factors that might come into play with operational databases. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Rebecca Farrell. Uh, Dr. Farrell is the program director for the Biological Anthropology Program at the uh, National Science Foundation. And as such, she manages a diverse uh, portfolio of projects in um, human and primate evolution and biology. But she also works with uh, agencies and colleagues on problems that are um, interesting to for and relevant to forensic science and serves as the program officer for uh, the Center for Advanced Research in Forensic Science, which is an NSF-funded uh, industry uh, university cooperative research uh, center. Dr. Farrell has a PhD from the Pennsylvania State University in anthropology. Uh, she was then a postdoctoral fellow at Georgetown University Center for Population uh, Health um, and Health and was then an assistant professor of anthropology at Howard University. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll, um, again, 10, 12 minutes would be great. Thanks. Okay. Good morning. Well, so thank, thanks to all of the organizers uh, for inviting me, and I'm pleased to be part of this session with my fellow federal agency counterparts. Um, NSF is a little bit different in this group of federal agencies because we have a very, very broad mission. Um, in 1950, Congress determined that it would be good to have an independent federal agency whose mission was to support basic and fundamental research across all areas of science and engineering. And that is what NSF became. And uh, the way that we do that is by supporting extramural peer-reviewed research. And that comes in the form of, of actual basic research projects, uh, instrumentation and facilities. And so you may have heard about the, the ships and the Arctic and um, we also have collaborations between private and public uh, organizations and federal agencies. We are training the next generation of science and engineers through the funding that we provide um, in terms of science education, STEM education. Um, and then more recently in our current strategic plan, there's been a real em emphasis on innovation and partnerships. And as I said, it's across all areas of science and engineering. And I wanted to just show this picture here because we do have seven, seven different directorates. You know, every agency has its own uh, hierarchy and organization. We have biological sciences, engineering, math and physical sciences, computer science, ge ge geosciences, um, the education and human resources directorate, and then my directorate, social, behavioral, and economic sciences, where I think there's a lot of potential for um, opportunities in forensic uh, and criminal justice relevant research and a couple of additional offices. Um, I really liked the summary slide that Dr. Butler showed, um, showing all the different things that have been going on. And NSF has been part of a lot of those conversations from the beginning. Uh, Dr. Mark Weiss, who's a former division director for my division in SBE, was part of that at the beginning and then uh, when I came five years ago, I became involved in some of these activities. Um, so I won't go over all of those details, other than to say that there was the question, NSF as a, as a broad, with a broad scope, what can NSF's role be as part of supporting um, advancing forensic science? And so what I'm gonna just share very briefly here, uh, ongoing activities are individual grants that might be supported across a range of core programs special calls for proposals, the federal partnerships that have already been mentioned. I'll specifically talk about the Industry University Cooperative Research Center that has been set up in forensic science, and then a couple of other program developments, and I'm gonna do that in six minutes. Um, I, I wanna also stress that before 2009, if you did a search of our database, the NSF database, for the keyword forensic or forensic science, there were a lot of things already going on, and so that's, not really that surprising considering that these are 
you know, grassroots, ground up efforts, investigator driven research projects. And some of those things are going to be relevant to forensic research, although they tend to be on the more fundamental as opposed to applied end. And I've just listed here for some of our directorates topics that I think are relevant to forensic science and maybe more broadly criminal justice. Um, MRI is our major re research instrumentation program, which is a cross directorate activity that also has contributed a lot in terms of the, the technical and um, the tools that are used uh, in, in labs and shared across labs at different institutions. Uh, I also wanted to mention that in addition to the cognitive bias workshop, and you see cognitive bias up there, uh, there have been a couple other workshops that have come out of um, at the, G, the GW workshop in 2015 on research evaluation in forensic science, which I don't think was mentioned. So more specifically, that's, that's the broad picture. And I, I also wanted to mention that, um, just to give you an idea of the scope of, of funding, um, and again, this will be an overestimate because I'm using a key term, right, forensic. There could be a lot of noise in that keyword. But just since 2017, active awards um, that pop up forensic in the abstract or title, the education directorate has supported $100 million, computer science, $25 million, math and physical science, $14 million, engineering, $12 million, SBE, $9 million. And again, those are going to cover things that maybe we're not considering laboratory forensic science, so things like digital forensics, cybersecurity, education, and so forth, but it is quite broad. Now the Dear Colleague Letters, this is the way that NSF reaches out to the research communities to let people know topics that we're particularly interested in seeing proposals come in on to our core programs. So we don't have a forensic science program at NSF. We have lots of different core programs within those seven directorates. Um, these are all things that we did in conjunction with the National Institute of Justice. And so in many cases, the things that are coming out of these Dear Colleague Letters are co-funded, usually 50-50, um, with, with NIJ. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the Indus Industry University Research Center's program because um, this is one of the things that I think is really unique that NSF brings to the table. It's an NSF program that's now 45 years old. There are something like 70 active centers, mostly in engineering and, and computer science. And the basic idea is, NSF provides administrative funding, universities provide the researchers and students, and industry partners provide funding through an annual membership fee to pay for actual research and to make recommendations about which projects should be completed within that center. And by doing so, by paying that membership, they get exclusive access to the intellectual property and the outcomes of that research. The center that we have is called the Center for Advanced Research in Forensic Science. The center director is Dr. Jose Almaral. Many of you know Dr. Almaral at Florida International Univers University and there are a number of other research sites. Um, it's very broad. Again, it's very, very broad. And you can see that some of the areas that have been focused in on based on the researchers involved in the center are chemistry, molecular biology, digital forensics, entomology, and even some anthropology. I'm not gonna go through all of the details here, but this is just to give you an idea of who some of the members are, which include other government agencies who have particular project interests, um, and with, again, NIJ serving as a co-sponsor of the center. I also wanna point out that the CARFS Center will be providing additional information about CARFS at the upcoming AAFS meeting uh, in Anaheim in February. And then we have our next round of meetings for the, in, the uh, Industry Advisory Board coming up uh, next year. All right, I only have two more content, content slides. One is I wanted to point out that within the Social Behavioral and Economic Sciences Directorate, within the Division of Social and Economic Sciences, we have a program that was formerly called Law and Social Science. And they have repositioned um, and now are, are being called Law and Science. And I think that the goal in, in making that name change is to really emphasize that they're interested not just in social science um, and how that inter interacts with law and criminal justice, but how all of these other factors and, and research areas, including forensic science, laboratory-based forensic science, um, might interact with the courts. And so I, I encourage all of you to take a look, you know, go to Google, put in LSNSF, and it should pop up to their website. 
Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities here for uh, investigators who are interested in doing fundamental research that will address some of the issues that we're discussing today. The last thing is NSF has 10 big ideas right now. These are particular topical areas that uh, they want to see uh, real focus and, and innovation and moving forward on those particular research areas. And one of those, which isn't actually a, a research topic, is the concept of convergent research, which I don't think is really going to be something new or surprising to most of you sitting here. It's, it's a more problem-based but still ground up approach, an interdisciplinary approach, bringing together the best people from a number of different research areas to solve a particular set of questions or problems. I think that the fact that NSF is focusing on this is also um, really valuable and creates opportunities for uh, collaboration with other agencies on forensic science. So in summary, um, we support research across all fields of science and engineering at a basic and fundamental level. Um, we continue to support research uh, across a large number of programs, um, which is sometimes hard to quantify, um, that, are, that are things that are relevant to forensic science and criminal justice. We are coordinating and continue to coordinate with NIJ. Um, and, you know, we have these, these things about us that are because we are such a broad funder of research that I think could be useful. So we have a wide range of research communities. Um, we're focusing on innovative areas of technology and we're open to this model of convergence. And I just want to thank my colleagues at NIJ and at NSF. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. Any questions for Dr. Varel? This is a quiet audience this morning. No questions. Our speakers are perfect. All right. Our next speaker is Mr. Uh, Robert Ramotowski. Uh, he, uh, since you have to set your, yeah, yes, you? okay, I can speak loudly. So since 2019, June 2019, as a matter of fact, uh, he, beca he joined uh, NIST and he is uh, the Forensic Science Program Manager um, in Gaithersburg, uh, in the Gaithersburg campus. So his job duties includes overseeing uh, a lot of, a uh, wide range of uh, projects, about 100 projects in various areas in um, uh, forensics. And he also oversees uh, CSAFE. So I should be very nice to him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, prior to his position at NIST, uh, Mr. Ramotowski served 25 years as a research a chemist, document analyst, and chief forensic chemist of the United States Secret Service, a forensic sciences division in, um, uh, in Washington. Uh, he has a bachelor of science and a master's degree uh, in chemistry from the George Washington University. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, actually, I didn't have a uh, disclaimer slide up, so I'll actually have to uh, say that this is basically my opinion. It's not the established uh, positions of the Department of Commerce or NIST as a whole. Um, I also chose to put this quotation up that John also highlighted by L.J. O'Rourke. Uh, going back to 1936, there was still um, a call for people to say, hey, we need some change. We need more valid instruments, we need more valid methods. And so we can say what has happened since 2009 with the National Academies report, but we could also say what's happened since 1936 with this one quotation. Um, forensic science at NIST is basically uh, core, basically is measurement science research that is done in the individual laboratories. And then this provides um, data that reference materials or data that can be used by various um, customers out in the field, these law enforcement agencies and such. Um, it also aids in the documentary uh, standards process, and I'll talk a little bit more about that with the OSAC uh, creation. And we, we are desperately trying to reach out to the communities now to get ideas, understanding what are the uh, limitations of forensic laboratories in particular. And we've done a lot of that with some of the local labs here, including uh, Maryland State Police. So it's all part of this organization, but it's focused on conducting good sound science. 
Uh, also, as John mentioned, um, our history goes back to 1901 under what we used to be called National Bureau of Standards. Uh, Dr. Wilmer Souter, as John mentioned, was a pioneer in not only ballistics, but handwriting and typewriting cases, uh, worked approximately 838 cases that were documented. Uh, eventually, um, the Law Enforcement Standards Laboratory was formed in 1971. And then eventually that became part of what we call the Office of Law Enforcement Standards. And then shortly after, I think the um, National Academy is directly before that, uh, we actually formed a group called the Special Programs Office. And I'll explain why we actually did that. Now, basically the Special Programs Office is located as part of the Associate Director for Laboratory Programs. And as you can see, uh, As you can see here, these are the main laboratories that actually do the bulk of the work that we finance um, in our own agency. But you can see that the special programs office is off to the side here. And the reason for that basically is to better coordinate all the different forensic uh, projects that go across the NIST campus. So putting the special programs office in that position, instead of putting it in one of the laboratories, allows us to see across the entire campus what different um, projects are going on in the different laboratories. So we have different focus areas here, and I'll put those through really quickly. So the first is ballistics and associated tool marks. The second is digital and identification forensics. Third, forensic genetics. Fourth is statistics. Uh, fifth is toxin, and sixth is trace. Now, I'm not going to dwell basically on what exactly those definitions are, but that just gives you an idea of the broad overview of uh, these different groups that we have. For example, <clears throat> the second grouping, digital and identification forensics, covers not only digital evidence, but also some pattern evidence analysis. And sometimes things like pattern evidence research falls into the trace category as well. So these aren't exactly perfectly um, aligned necessarily to exactly what it says on that. Now where does this money go essentially? As I mentioned, um, these are the major laboratories that are associated with these topic areas. As you can see, MML is the uh, Materials Measurement Laboratory, ITL is the Information Technology Laboratory, and PML is the Physical Measurements Laboratory. Each one of these focus areas receives approximately $1.2 million a year in funding. Um, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually not when you actually collectively look at this. Um, there are a lot of overhead costs that get factored into that as well. So saying that you have roughly 7.2 million, no, it's not exactly that amount of money. These are some of the uh, topic areas within the ballistics and tool marks, uh, some of the projects that are uh, going on right now and, and have been completed. So you can get an idea of some of these. I'm not going to go into details on that. Um, in particular, looking at things that are not necessarily firearms for tool marks as well. So even though the uh, emphasis on this is on ballistics and firearms, there are also non-firearm uh, tool marks of interest. And my colleague, Robert Thompson, will talk a lot more about this work as well. So. I mentioned digital and identification. Um, these involve things like best practice guides. Um, a big component of this is the National Software Reference Library, which is continuously updated. Um, there's also tool testing programs in place that issue reports on those tools. And under forensic genetics, the big thing is kind of mixture interpretation, which is the subject area of one of the foundation reviews, as John mentioned this morning. Um, things like next generation sequencing, rapid DNA. These are some of the topics. Uh, for statistics, it's basically trying to improve interpretation of evidence, um, looking at things instead of just saying simply match, no match, is there probability, measurement uncertainty, things of that nature. So looking at things like likelihood ratios for the weight of evidence. Um, oops. Uh, yeah, trace elements and, and the glass standard reference material, uh, being able to quantify that and, and other SRMs as well. Under top uh, toxins, various drug libraries are being put together, uh, things like 
the recent uh, fentanyl analogs that come out. These are analyzed and characterized and placed into these um, databases, essentially. Uh, mass spectral libraries for just, you know, all different types of drugs, including uh, opioids as well. Um, the third one on that list is kind of interesting. It was we talked about outreach. Measuring drug background levels on surfaces in forensic laboratories was a cooperative effort with the Maryland State Police. And that was recently published um, in the forensic science journals. TRACE, um, there's a wide variety of different programs that come into TRACE because it's kind of an amorphous uh, defined field. So things like human hair um, keratins, looking at genetically variant peptide detection, uh, things like automotive paint analysis. Um, I mentioned the forensic glass reference material. Uh, even things like fire debris, characterization of fire debris and related matrices. And even things like fingerprints, as I mentioned, can fall under trace as well. Um, function test materials for fingerprint development reagents, basically testing to see if that reagent is actually working properly. Uh, community education outreach, we've hosted a lot of different meetings throughout the past roughly 10 years or so. Uh, some of these were mentioned by John. Um, just point out some of these in particular, the forensics at NIST is probably the longest standing one we've done. Essentially since 2012, it's been open basically to the community. Our scientists in those various um, laboratories will come and present their research at these various meetings. And it's open to the public. Uh, you simply come into the NIST campus. And they've been held almost regularly every two years. Uh, so the next one coming up will be in November of next year. Uh, we're still finalizing some of the logistics on that. Um, there was a uh, training session on mixture interpretation for DNA. And that was in 2013. Um, there was a forensic handwriting analysis um, meeting, basically, to go over basic state of the art of what um, is being done in the handwriting analysis area. And that's actually morphed into um, basically a, uh, a human factor study as well of handwriting, and I'll mention that in a little bit as well. And you can see some of these other ones, including things like mobile forensics, um, cloud computing, um, error management, as John mentioned, um, quantifying the weight of evidence, uh, trace evidence data workshop, uh, a workshop and symposium on synthetic opioids and the uh, overdose epidemic. And more recently, we've had the Research Innovation to Implementation Symposium. You know, we basically have to conduct research that matters and can be actually impactful to the community. So how better to transfer that material from the research stage to the community and the customers that need it? And then finally, we just recently held our Evidence Management Conference, uh, and that was in October of this year. NIST has worked on things like APHIS inter interoperability. Um, as it was noted, recommendation 12 of the NAS report really focuses on APHIS, inter APHIS interoperability. Um, NIST started working back as the National Bureau of Standards back in the 1960s on automated fingerprint searching, and they published the first standard for fingerprint exchange transmission standards basically in um, this 1986 document. Uh, can't say that there's a huge amount of success in this particular area as to getting everybody connected and on the same page. I remember from 25 years ago when I first started at the Secret Service, there was a map on the wall, and we had actually all three of the existent systems at the time, NEC, Morpho, and Printrack. And the map looked literally like a patchwork quilt. Uh, basically, many states could not talk to their neighboring states or communicate via um, exchange of fingerprints because they had different companies' um, equipment. And likewise, sometimes even a city within a state could not communicate with the state database because its version was different. So these are things that are still being worked on at the moment. So this is something where more effort and more uh, work needs to be done. Uh, the National Commission on Forensic Science was mentioned. I won't go into too much detail uh, beyond that other than uh, our own John Butler was a uh, vice chair of that committee. As he mentioned, uh, 13 meetings, roughly 43 work products, 
and 20 recommendations to the Attorney General, 23 views of the Commission, and one of those views I'll speak about shortly. The summary report and the video uh, recordings of all these different meetings are available on those links. Um, the OSAC group, this is essentially um, an outgrowth of what used to be TWIGs or technical working groups, which then became SWIGs or scientific working groups, and then eventually more formalized into the organization of scientific area committees. There are approximately five scientific area committees and approximately 25 subcommittees covering a wide range of different topics. And NIST is the host of this uh, OSAC group. And it collectively has about 550 members that uh, volunteer for each one of these different disciplines. So we mentioned the NAS report coming out in 2009. Um, DOJ and NIST signed an MOU in, two, in 2013, which eventually leads to the formation of the OSAC groups. Um, this is actually announced at the February 4th, 2014 meeting, and the very first meetings were held in January of 2015. So what does OSAC do? It facilitates development of standards through the formal SDO standards development um, office uh, process, uh, evaluates existing standards, and endorses standards on the registry and promotes their implementation. What it doesn't do is necessarily publish standards. That's what an SDO does. And it does not have the authority to enforce or, uh, any of these standards. Um, it was mentioned about NIST doing foundational reviews. Um, this was one of the views of the commission, one of those 23 that were published by the commission over that uh, four or five year period. Um, this one actually concerns the creation of these foundation reviews. And essentially it says all forensic science methodologies should be evaluated by an independent scientific body to characterize their capabilities and so on. And it designates NIST as the one to do that. And right now, the DNA mixture interpretation review is in process. Uh, the bite mark analysis review is in process as well. There's one to be started on firearm evidence and then another on digital evidence um, soon as well. We mentioned human factors working groups. My colleague, Melissa Taylor, will be talking more about that this afternoon. Um, there's been essentially four of those as well, as you can see. The latent print examination one was published in 2012. One for handwriting analysis is due out very, very soon, hopefully. Uh, in the future, we'll, we'll have one for DNA mixture and firearms examination. I mentioned standard reference materials. That's another thing that NIST produces for um, the forensic community as well as the greater scientific community as well. Um, but there are a range of forensic specific SRMs or standard reference materials, things like blood alcohol, um, specialized DNA uh, standards, drugs of abuse, um, you know, crime scene investigation related ones, for example, a trace explosive. And then we have the standard bullet, which is shown in the picture here. Oops, sorry. And then uh, lastly, I'll talk about CSAFE, which um, is basically our center of, ex of excellence, and it's funded approximately $20 million over a five-year period, and is a combination of these various groups. I don't have the Duke one on there yet, so I'll have to amend that. Sorry about that. Um, but essentially, focusing primarily on statistics and its application to forensic evidence. And these are some of the projects, um, basically, to give you a good overview of what CSAFE is doing. Um, in those areas, when we say probabilistic and, and statistical approaches, it can involve a lot of different subcategories. For example, handwriting evaluation, um, even footwear um, identification, building databases, and getting um, more robust uh, results. Um, as I mentioned, the shoe prints. Also, um, some firearms-related um, research. And then importantly too, they do outreach and teaching and instructing groups like lawyers and jurors um, on what is the nature of this evidence, how, how to go about interpreting it. Um, also looking at things like uncertainty, measurement, error, and statistical interpretation of evidence. And then training uh, st statisticians in uh, forensic science. Um, so those are pretty much the kind of 
projects that, that the CSAFE uh, Center of Excellence does. And I'll wrap it up with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. Hopefully I didn't go too far over. Last but not least, um, we'll finish the session. Well, first of all, is there any questions for uh, our speaker? Again, no questions. Okay. Um, last but not least, uh, Mr. Jim Peters is our is going to close the session. Uh, he is the chief of counterterrorism and forensic science research at the FBI lab. Um, he leads a very large staff of researchers um, at, that develop new and improved methods uh, to analyze forensic <laughs> evidence. Uh, his research portfolio includes projects in just about every area, anthropology, biology, chemistry, explosives, genetics, geology, microbiology, statistics, and toxicology. Uh, I, um, I think I've seen people with lots of master's degree, but nobody <laughs> with as many as you have. It's a hobby. Uh, yeah, it must be. Uh, so, uh, uh, Jean Peters has a master's degree in uh, geology, another one in engineering, and the most recent one in statistics. Almost there. Almost there. Okay, good. So, encouragement to finish that one up. Um, thank you so much, and please take it away. The master's degree in statistics is not at Iowa State, so there's no conflict of interest there. <laughs> and to clarify, uh, I do lead a uh, large staff of, of portfolios and projects. The researchers themselves are of average size. <laughs> Since so much of forensics focuses on precision and accuracy, I felt it was important to clarify that. As with all the other speakers, the opinions are my own, not an FBI or US government position. Any commercial product names mentioned are for illustrative purposes only. So what I'd like to uh, talk about this morning is the research that we have underway at the FBI laboratory. Uh, what you see in the graphic images are the photographs of some research underway. They all represent different projects across the portfolio that Alicia mentioned. But our main motivations for doing this research are threefold. One is to develop new capabilities, new ways of examining evidence that our colleagues at the FBI laboratory and across the forensic science community don't currently have. A second motivation is to improve the existing processes. Can we make them better, faster, more sensitive, more efficient in some manner? And most importantly, to strengthen the scientific foundations, as many other speakers have alluded to, so that when our examiners testify, they're doing so from a firm foundation of scientific principles. We have been in the business of doing research for more than 80 years. The FBI's technical laboratory, originally the criminological laboratory, was established in the early 1930s. And as you can see in this quote from then Director Hoover, part of the overall analysis of scientific evidence included research to continually improve and develop new capabilities. To do this since 1981, we've had a dedicated staff of full-time researchers. Uh, we currently have 10 principal investigators. We have a postdoc program. We call it the Visiting Scientist Program. It's mostly postdoctoral researchers, but we also take masters and bachelors, faculty on sabbatical, and uh, researchers from other government agencies to come and do research in our facilities where they can conduct research that is, uh, and this is an important component of our model, that is complemented by casework staff. All of our research teams have representatives from the corresponding casework disciplines in the FBI laboratory and occasionally from other agencies. We do have dedicated research facilities. We have about 25,000 square feet of dedicated laboratories uh, and instrumentation. That's the internal research that we conduct. We do supplement that with cooperative research with colleagues, uh, the rest of the gang of four up here, uh, as well as many other agencies, Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security. We partner with academic institutions and occasionally contract out research when it's appropriate. Uh, throughout our history, we've made uh, many contributions well before my time uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, through analytical chemistry, all the pattern ev evidence disciplines, and DNA. So that's a little bit of a historical perspective. How we manage the research, uh, we have always had some form of a governance model. It has changed, evolved many times over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. 
We currently have a research strategy that governs where we prioritize our needs. I usually say there are more problems than people time or money to solve in forensic science. So we have a strategy that governs where we invest those limited resources, parsing out into strategic versus more tactically focused, casework specific focused research. We do have a research review team that comprises six senior level scientists and myself, where we evaluate the proposals for no, new research against that research strategy and casework needs. We evaluate the ideas, proposals, plans, the progress that's being made, essentially make those go and no-go decisions, monitor in the progress, and decide when the research is complete enough. Not every research project proceeds through success, so sometimes we have to make hard decisions as to when to cease investing in a given area. As I mentioned earlier, we have a uh, dedicated research staff that include casework representation. We also have uh, internal to the FBI, our own internal uh, institutional review board for the protection of human subjects and research. I always find it's important to define what we mean when we say that our research is successful. How do we know when we're done? How will we recognize when we can move on to another high priority area? Uh, my working definition of success, many of you have heard this before, it's some form of delivery, whether it's a, a new or improved method, most of our DNA and chemical analysis projects result in some form of an analytical method, occasionally devices and prototypes and software, some form of technical information and scientific publications. But most importantly for our success model at the FBI laboratory, we have to change the business practice. We don't really consider it successful until the results of our research, if they have been successful, have been adopted into active casework. Somehow changing the business model, deploying a new method, or trying to understand if it has improved that defensibility. Some of our metrics and statistics shown up here, uh, I won't go through them all, but we have uh, many different cross-agency collaborative projects. Uh, some of my colleagues, uh, Jonathan, spoke about rapid DNA. Uh, it extends through many of our larger scale portfolios, including all the aspects of DNA analysis to include massively parallel DNA sequencing, larger scale geographic attribution, understanding the source or point of origin for trace evidence, geologic materials. Uh, many of our cross-agency work involves explosives and other threat agents because that represents a government-wide enterprise. We've got uh, many hundreds of completed projects for a historical perspective. I note that in the time between 1999 and 2009, there were 156 completed projects. Uh, over the last 10 years or so, it's been about 285. And as I mentioned earlier, we've made uh, many contributions to DNA, chemistry, pattern evidence, and most importantly, what I call decision analysis studies, more colloquially known as black box and white box studies. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, since 2010, we've published uh, 260 scientific papers. That's laboratory-wide, uh, so it's about 30 or so per year. We've made many thousands of presentations, uh, many of which you've probably seen before. We've trained forensic scientists. Uh, I mentioned earlier a visiting scientist program. This is an important outreach component for the FBI laboratory. We bring in early career scientists at the bachelor's, master's, and postdoctoral level. Uh, we've had about 200 of these early career fellowships since 2010. Uh, it is a stipended position. It's a fairly generous stipend. They are uh, re annual appointments, renewable for up to five years, so that they can experience the full life cycle of research. We generally have 25 to 40 projects active at any one time. These can range from six-month projects to 10-year projects uh, across a, a wide variety of scales. Our alumni from the Visiting Scientist Program, about a third of which have joined the FBI, mostly as casework examiners, but also uh, we've put some of our scientists into the special agent ranks, the intelligence analyst ranks, uh, as well as the, the pure sciences. About 16% have gone on to other federal agencies, 11% uh, to state and locals, about 13% into academia, and 22% into the private sector. So what this investment represents for the FBI is Early career scientists who have received training and, and had the opportunity to work on these dedicated research teams that can take what they've learned from our research out into 
the larger uh, forensic science community across the entirety of its enterprise. As I mentioned, we, uh, we do count research publications as one of our most important outreach efforts. We publish about 30 or so a year. Uh, this slide gives a, just a snapshot of some of our active and uh, recently completed projects. Uh, many of these have been done in conjunction with other agencies in some form or another. We're going to talk a little bit more specifically about the decision analysis projects in just a moment. But each of these represents a discrete effort wrapped up into a larger portfolio. You can see that I've grouped both by portfolios on the left and those three main research motivations that I spoke of earlier on the right-hand side of the slide. Developing new capabilities, new ways of looking at evidence that we couldn't before. Improving existing processes. The first sub-bullet there, quantitative polymerase chain reaction. We're on version three of an assay that was developed some time ago. That reflects our effort to continually improve our business practices. The scientific defensibility, one of the most important motivations for doing this research. The decision analysis studies, population studies, studying permanence of fingerprints. We had a very large scale paper published early last year that examined fingerprint feature permanence over time scales from months to decades. So we want to put these things out there so that when our examiners testify, they've got that firm foundation. I've mentioned black box studies, decision analysis studies a couple of times. Uh, my colleague Joanne Bascalia is going to speak uh, in much greater detail about one of them, the fingerprint study. But to introduce the concept in a general sense, these are discipline wide. They don't represent how well FBI laboratory examiners do because our effort is to incorporate the totality of the forensic enterprise. So we solicit participation in these research studies from federal labs, state labs, local labs, private practice examiners, and international partners as well. So that when we put out information, it represents that discipline as a whole, which goes to strengthen the foundation. It can address the question, and I like the term that PCAS used in the top right bullet, validity as applied. It's not necessarily foundational validity, but it is establishing that when examiners conduct their work and testify, there is some degree of validity that is represented by figures like on the middle left column, the accuracy of their analysis, how repeatable and reproducible it is. And Joanne's going to speak in greater detail about this. One of the reasons we call it black box studies uh, is that they are method independent. John and uh, Robert spoke to um, recommendations for standardizing approaches, our keynote speaker at the beginning. But we recognize that is not the reality as it applies today. So we allow the participants in our research study from all these different laboratories to use their own internal methods. We want them to do the work as close to casework as they reasonably can. They are resource intensive studies. Uh, they require dedicated research staff and practitioners. There are many design components that we have to factor in, whether it's the number of participants, how representative of the discipline and practice, sample difficulty, structural designs. We try to structure our, our uh, experiments to be as close to a double blind study as we can with fully open set designs. We have four studies underway, fingerprints, shoe prints, firearms, and tire treads. Uh, the fingerprint study is the most mature. Joanne's going to speak to that after our break. You can see some basic uh, information about it on the screen, about 170 participants. This has resulted in 11 or 12 publications so far in peer-reviewed scientific journals, very mature study. We're in the uh, midst of data analysis for the firearm study. Perhaps some of your examiners have participated in this. You can see in the second bar that we are in the uh, testing, I'm sorry, in the analysis phase. We've completed all the, um, the data collection efforts. We're now running the numbers to establish the error rates the accuracy, the repeatability, and reproducibility. Those are the foundational questions we're seeking to answer. In the boxes, you can see, I don't know how legible it is on the screen, uh, we have about 50 firearms, about 200 participants who have looked at more than 30,000 test fires. In total, we'll have about 20,000 decisions where an examiner has looked at a sample set 
and made that decision about match, no match, can't tell, using the, uh, the AFTI theory of identification. We're in more active recruitment and data collection phases for shoe prints and handwriting. Uh, we have test sets out right now. We have about 100 participants enrolled in each of those studies. We're always looking for more. Uh, and again, our goal is to have on the order of about 10,000 individual decisions at matching Qs and Ks by the end of those studies so that we can establish error rates, repeatability, and reproducibility for those. Uh, this is the summary and a, and a lead into Joanne's talk later. Uh, the, these are some of the publications that have resulted from our fingerprint study. So with that, I'm about on time. Happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much. Any questions? Ah, there's a question. Hi, good morning. Um, and this is really a question either for you or for anyone on the panel. Um, so there's over 400 public forensic labs in the United States, and the vast majority of those are at the state and local level. And so I'm just curious if you could talk about how you've been able to take your work at the federal level and improve practice at the state and local level or encourage or help innovation there. And if not, what are the challenges in doing so? Jonathan, why don't you take the state and local since NIJ has a program specifically for that. Live now? OK, good. No, thank you for the question. So I, I would heavily encourage you when the needs assessment report comes out to, to take a look at it because it'll, it'll provide, I think, a, a lay of the land um, in terms of what uh, state and local crime labs uh, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and, and what their needs are and, and how, um, what kind of challenges are associated with those needs in order to uh, implement new technologies and really just get the day-to-day -day, you know, work uh, out the door uh, based on the requests that are coming in. So one thing, and we've, we've talked about this um, at length over the last couple of years too, is we've been leaning very heavily on the uh, Project Foresight data. So Project Foresight was a program that NIJ funded at West Virginia University to take a look at the, the cost of doing business within crime labs across the United States. And I think um, up to this point, I think about half the crime labs uh, submit data to Project Foresight. So I think that the data that shows, you know, the number of FTEs that are need, the full-time employees that are needed, the number of uh, cases that come in the door, um, what we've seen from the data, and we have got um, Paul Speaker is the economist who's been working on this program for the last decade. Basically, as more casework comes in the door and gets reported on and goes back out the door, there's an increase in the number of requests, and they've seen this specifically for, for the DNA uh, discipline. I imagine um, with the opioid crisis and, and other issues that the labs are facing, there's uh, continuous, um, continuously need to be, um, uh, like the, the newest emerging issues are going to impact the crime lab in one way, shape, or form. And so I think that's something to be mindful of um, with policy decisions that are made at the state and local levels. I mean, we, we hear the impact of the, uh, the farm bill or the, the new changes on the, uh, the identification of, of tetrahydrocannabinol in hemp um, to uh, determine what may or may not be a, a suspected uh, um, seized substance. Um, I think what NIJ's tried to do over the years is uh, increase its level of engagement with the state and local uh, counterparts uh, through working groups, through forums, through roundtables, and as I mentioned, a number of the, the NIJ-funded uh, Forensic Technology Center of Excellence events and products are freely available. Uh, many of the, the working groups, we tried to get the message out to the community as best we can, um, depending on the, the issue or the nature of the topic that's, uh, that needs to be addressed. So I think we're very mindful of the needs when they're brought to our attention. We try to think of think outside the box on different ways to, to address those issues. So again, I encourage you to check out the report because we, we included a number of promising practices that we identify in the community and we think that can be you know, translated and replicated across the, the nation. I think if I could add to that, um, there are significant barriers to entry for the introduction of innovation. NIST sponsored a conference, John and Robert both mentioned it, the R2I2. Uh, research, to research to implementation to address some of those barriers. Uh, within the FBI laboratory itself, the, way, the best way we have of ensuring that the results of research are actually used is by involving the casework practitioners, the, our customers or clients, directly in the research project so that they have a voice in the experimental design, what instruments are used 
to, so that the results are as directly applicable and they have a better understanding of the challenges that need to be overcome because the, the best defense for, uh, for a testifying examiner is, is I do it the way everybody has done it, has always done it, always will do it. Innovation is risk in the legal system. I usually use the analogy of the pharmaceutical products. Do you want to be the first person to try an experimental new drug if it's not a life-threatening situation? Examiners face similar risk when they testify when they use a new or novel technique for the first time. So we try and reduce the amount of risk by publishing in scientific journals to establish as much acceptance in the scientific community as possible, but also to involve and engage the end users in as much of the research as possible. Thank you. Uh, Linda. Yeah. Um, thanks so much. Uh, I, do, I also have a couple questions that might apply to um, more than one speaker. Um, so the first, uh, we've heard a lot from, I think, NIJ and um, NSF in particular about the uh, need for innovative research, innovations, which I certainly agree with. But I also wanted to get your thoughts on the need for re replication of research. And so NIJ, um, are you open to funding work that is basically a replication study, or do you require replication within a proposal that you're funding? Um, and the same for NSF or anybody else's thoughts. And uh, Mr. Peters, are you, in your studies that you're doing, the black box studies, are you, is there a replication uh, piece of that design? So if I could if we could get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll just give a real quick, um, I guess, NIJ perspective. So I don't think we have a requirement, per se, uh, that the research be replicated. Um, I think it's obviously very helpful. Um, I, I don't think it's something limited to the forensic science community, uh, quite frankly. I think the National Academies of Science came out with a report just about a month ago on reproducibility and accuracy, and, and it's, it's something that permeates, I think, everything we do. I mean, we're talking about limited funds just to do the research in the first place. It, it just, it's an added um, challenge, really, to, to get to that point of having you know, reproducible um, types of studies. For our studies uh, specifically, and Joanne will go into this in much greater detail, yes. Every examiner does a first pass through, every participant rather, first pass through. They also see a subset of samples that they have seen before after a time gap. That's the repeatability. We also shop those samples out to other examiners to establish reproducibility. I think broadly, and, and Jonathan alluded to this, that it's not a problem set limited to forensics. At the 2017 Joint Statistical Meeting of the American Statistical Association, one of the keynote speakers raised this very issue that the academic research model is built on innovation and being different. Doing the 12th study of a similar design rarely gets external funding. Because our research is internally funded, we can do as much repeat type work as needed to establish that foundational validity. But I think in the broader research marketplace, overcoming a barrier to doing reproducibility studies is, is perhaps re-examining the grant-making model. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, I think NSF for many years, and I agree with everyone, this is a larger problem than just in forensic science. We, we focus a lot on generalizability when our panels meet. Is this a one-off study or is this something, is this process or this theory that we're advancing knowledge on, is this, is this going to apply to more than this one case? Um, I think NSF has also been in deep discussions about reproducibility, replicability, particularly in areas in the social and behavioral sciences, like the psychological sciences, where, again, generalizability is it just this one weird population of college undergrads that we're studying, or is this something that might apply much more broadly? I, I think there is that tension with limited funds, which is you, you can't probably fund the same project over and over again. But yes, we're definitely aware. Yeah, likewise. Um, one of the things that we try to do is reach out to the community and you know, work with local crime labs and some of the federal partners as well to test some of the products that our scientists are creating or methods, whatever the case may be. In one particular case, there was a, um, <clears throat> a fingerprint test material, which I mentioned in my talk. Um, we were going to look at at least three different partners to test reproducibility and repeatability of these tests out into the community. So things like that, outreaching, 
and, and again, these labs have limited capabilities and, and, and resources and time, so this is not something they can do full-time basis. Thank you. One last question. Can you please uh, identify yes. yourself? Thank you. I'm Dave Rabinowitz. Uh, this is for everyone. I don't remember hearing the term artificial intelligence mentioned at all. AI has recently been announced as outperforming physicians in reading mammograms and other x-rays and stuff like that. Is anybody funding AI research for forensics? So short answer, yes. Yes. Go to the NIJ website and you go to the number of awards and just do some keyword searches. So just Google NIJ awards and you'll see uh, some of the things that we're doing. I can't speak to how extensively we're doing it across all forensic science disciplines, but I do know we've funded um, some machine learning uh, grants recently. I believe um, maybe a little bit more leaning towards the digital forensics. Um, we have some uh, uh, awards that are part of our drugs and crime portfolio that are looking, f looking at basically machine learning to identify trends uh, in terms of uh, drug markets. I would add NSF is, is very interested in artificial intelligence and again, of course, it's not focused in just on forensic science. I actually had an image that I took out just to shorten my, my presentation, uh, which was a sort of a text map of all of the different places where AI and machine learning are being used and so I think there's a lot of opportunities there for forensic science. Ah, there we are. Uh, the core is not necessarily forensic science oriented, um, but you can definitely go on the website, the NIST website, and, and, and look the projects up as well. Yeah, much of the, work, the research we do at CSAFE is on machine learning and, and uh, learning algorithms, we call them, statistical learning algorithms. Um, thank you so much, everybody. We have a break coming up, and the meeting will, re uh, will reconvene at 11 a.m. One last uh, thanks to our speakers.